Hello, 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 hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show. Hope you can hear me loud and clear. Hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. It's the Agassino Zynga Show, episode number 333. Thank you for tuning in. I know it's been a while. It's been a long time. I haven't been here in a while. For those of you who've been wondering, yes, I have been very, very ill these last couple of days, unfortunately. Um, you know, standard man flu shit, I think. But mostly I had this really, really minging, minging, minging sinus infection um, to the point where the front of my head was feeling great, massively heavy. I had crazy dizziness slash vertigo going on. Um, yeah, I, I had that weird, horrible taste of like, you know, sinus infection in the back of my tongue. I couldn't really taste stuff too well. Um, it wasn't COVID, luckily, but it was just a really bad sinus infection. So I had to um, get myself sorted out. And like every normal man out there, like every red-blooded male out there, I really waited until the last minute, right? I kind of toughed it out at home. I didn't leave. I just took loads of aspirin and painkillers. And then I then plucked up the courage to go to a GP and get myself some actual antibiotics and shit. And um, now I'm on the mend. So I'm a little bit better now. Hence why I'm back in front of the, you know, in front of the microphone talking to you lovely people. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a mad one. Christmas was a bit crap as well because of, you know, I was still suffering from the sinus infection and shit. And yeah, it's kind of messed up all my New Year's Eve plans, New Year's Day plans. I'm kind of pissed. I'm not going to lie because I'm still feeling groggy now. And obviously I'm on antibiotics. So, you know, I can't exactly be boozing it up, can I? So maybe it's a good thing going into the new year. I'm going to start off clean. I'm going to start off fresh and shit. But Jesus, man, what a, um, what a, what a less than desirable way to end the year. I'm not going to say it's a bad thing, but what a less than desirable, what a less than desirable way to end the year. That's what I'll say. Um, but yeah, happy that I've got that sorted out. And, um, now it's just being on the mend and, I don't know. I think with age, I become a little bit more mature. I think in the past, if I was this ill, I would have just toughed it out. I would have gone to the gym. I would have gone on a run, right? Because I, I don't know why I had this weird thing when I was younger. I had this weird notion in my head is that if, I, if I went out for a run, that I would suddenly clear my lungs of all ailments or something. And it was obviously not true. It's obviously good for your mental clarity and mental fortitude sorry to be able to work out still even when you're sick but if you're sick you should rest you should rest you should take whatever medicine you can take and then go from there and I'm not usually somebody that gets sick often anyway right I don't really get sick often but when I do get sick I get sick right I get that man sick where I'm fucking useless and shit so um I'm glad I didn't go out to the gym. I'm glad I didn't try and push my body um, to do crazy things when I need to really heal and get better. And now that I'm on my course of antibiotics, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting on the mend a bit. Um, it's still a bit mad because, you know, I can't eat as much as I wanted to and shit. <laughs> and, um, you know, having to take pills on a, some, I won't say it, a half empty stomach right i'm kind of just eating you know a couple of bagels maybe some soup here and there and a banana you know pause um and that's basically it my rest of my belly's flipping rumbling but hey we make it work we make it work so i'm sure there's most of you out there as well who probably maybe suffering from cold as well flu i think i don't know why every time i go outside to you know do my little food shopping and shit it's always like i'm passing somebody in the supermarket and everyone's coughing and sneezing so i'm not too sure what's going on maybe there's a new variant going around maybe people are just suffering from whatever they're suffering from but if you are cooped up somewhere i hope you get well soon for those of you i haven't seen since christmas hope you had a good christmas um i didn't really do much during christmas went to see my family hanged out with them for a bit had some dinner chilled with my little brothers and shit drank a little bit oh had some ray and nephew bombarati that was a bad idea ray and nephew boy god almighty that is that is a potion from from hell that's a potion from hell. I literally had a thumb's worth of it in a cup and it knocked me out. I was sleeping for the most of the time. I was with my brothers and kept like, you know, waking, kept kept going in and out of consciousness and shit. And I was talking to my brothers about it. I was like, I can't believe there's people out there because I remember going to Carnival um, and seeing, because, you know, I, I don't know, maybe because the area I live in, there's not a lot of Caribbean people in the area that I live in, right? It's mostly Africans and shit and they mostly drink like um, Guinness and shit. But you don't really see people drinking Ray Nephews or whatnot. So I guess when you go to Carnival, that's when you see a lot of it because, you know, Carnival, they have a lot of Ray Nephew sponsorships and shit and blah, blah, blah. Um, and you see people in Carnival, legitimately, you see guys in Carnival with a bottle of Ray Nephews to the face. They're just drinking that. They're literally walking down the street, drinking that to the face. And 
I swear to God, you open a bottle of Ray and Nephews and just smell it from like five feet away and you're going to get high. So I can't understand how guys are able to down that shit to the face with no chaser out in the streets, sun beaming, weed and stuff like some people out there are made different. I can't do it, man. I wish I had the liver to do it, but I cannot do it. I swear to God. I swear to God. I can't do it. So I'm happy um, <laughs> that I tasted a little bit of it and I went from there. But Christmas was okay and nothing else to report from there, to be honest. So I hope you guys had a good Christmas. Anyway, um, less said about that. Let's just jump right into the show. Don't want to waste more of your time. <sighs> um, Manchester United. I'm kind of glad I didn't. I'm kind of glad I wasn't you know well enough anyway to get on here and record a podcast about about my united's comeback win against aston villa i'm glad i wasn't well enough because i had a feeling and most united fans would sense had a feeling that this was a fluke result and if you actually watched the game um united played against villa you would have known that villa really played more into our hands as opposed to us playing really well i think the thing about man united that people don't understand is that we are a terrible football team but we do have individuals on their day who can win us football games which is why our fan base re you know refers to us as individual brilliance fc that's what we're referred to as commonly because we do have players individually who can win us games so if you give those players chances they will punish you that's the thing about Man United. But if you beat us in terms of, you know, having a cohesive style of play, if you kind of kill the game, if you, you know, get a massive head start in terms of goals, there's no there's no way we're going to fight back. But if you give us a window, an opportunity to get some goals in, we're obviously going to take them. So that's what basically happened at Aston Villa. Aston Villa maybe were a little bit too confident, maybe a little bit too arrogant because of how poorly we've been playing and how well they've been playing. And obviously our comparative league positions, they got two, they got two goal leads head start and they kind of took their of the pedal um they also kept defending with that high line and they just invited pressure from us really and that ball over the top that ball down the flanks was always on and we exploited it and obviously we were able um to claw back the 3-2 win and of course the main point of it i thought was the main point to kind of like you know be happy about was more so the Rasmus Hoyland goal. His first goal in the Premier League, as you can see here when against Villa, he was incredibly ecstatic about it, really happy for him um, because, you know, he's literally playing in one of the worst positions you can play for United, being up front. I think the second worst position is maybe being United goalkeeper, maybe a fullback or a midfielder. Um, just anywhere around the pitch for United is fucking horrible. But playing up front for Man United is a real thankless task. So he doesn't get much service. Um, there's a stat that came out recently that he gets the least amount of service of most top strikers in the European leagues and in general it's been a really 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 um, hard slog for him settling into the Premier League so him scoring a goal against Villa was great for him personally um, and the way he finished it as well um, the ball kind of bouncing back at him and then you know no no bounce no nothing straight volley um, side foot into the flipping um, you know right inside of the goal out stretch of the goalkeeper brilliant finish happy about that but overall I wasn't too giddy about his performance I'm not going to lie happy about us having a comeback and stuff and obviously watching it as a fan but this wasn't in indicative of us kind of you know kickstarting our season because we didn't play well we allowed Villa to get a two goal lead head start without much effort and um, they didn't really have to even to come out of second or third gear I don't think to even get that league start and if anything if Villa didn't take their fourth the pedal if they were a little bit more conservative in how they played in the second half, if they maybe tightened up defensively, they could have easily won that game you know four nil if they wanted to but they kept giving us openings and we punished them cool then that brought us obviously to this week's game against Nottingham Forest and a lot of people were assuming that we were going to win this game also because of the previous game against Aston Villa but I wasn't too certain because Forest have got a new manager in Nuno Espirito Santo most of you would know him from his time at Wolves um, I think he unfortunately got fired from I think a job in the Middle East so he came back um, obviously to the UK after Steve Cooper and Nottingham Forest was, was sacked and I was always of the assertion that Nottingham Forest are in a bit of a false position in the league because they've got a decent squad. They've got the right mix of personalities. They've got the right mix of profiles of players from players who have maybe been let go from other top clubs, like, you know, Alangas to like up and coming players who are trying to make a name for themselves, who obviously are using Nottingham Forest as like a springboard to go and play for another top European club, like, you know, the Danilos, the Marillos and stuff. They have a good mix of players who I think on their day, could actually give most teams in the league a run for their money and could actually finish a lot higher than what they currently are. So I thought all they need is obviously a manager just to get the right combination right. And so far, 
Nuno has got the combination spot on. He's, you know, got the best out of what he's had available. They're still playing that transitional counter-attacking football that they're kind of known for. And if anything, they just exploited all of our weaknesses when it comes to the transition because obviously for some reason Ericsson Hag is continuing to persist with this single pivot so the single pivot this time was Kobe Mino um, sometimes it's, it's Scott McTominay but he always persists with a single pivot and the problem with the single pivot is that when you have runners in the likes of Ilanga um, Dominguez Gibbs White running in behind there are too many players for that single pivot to cover and obviously with fullbacks or sorry with attacking wingers like Garnacho and Anthony um, especially Garnacho who don't track back you're going to have loads of open spaces where these players can run into and obviously exploit which ended up happening in terms of both for the goals I think so so I was not that confident before the game I honestly did think it was going to be a tough one but I didn't expect it to be such a bad game to watch objectively the first half was a complete no show um the less said about that the better I think I legitimately must have fell asleep two or three times um trying to watch the first half the second half obviously everything kicked off by then but I definitely feel like you know, the goal that even we got from Nottingham Forest was more so because of Matt Turner's inability to pass out from the back, as opposed to us actually constructing anything of a decent attacking flow. And even the statistics are really strange. If you look at the statistics on here via Google, it says here that we had 10 shots. It doesn't feel like we had 10 shots at all. That's why I mean statistics aren't really the be on end all of games you have to just watch them with your own eyes because it didn't feel like a 10 shot to eight game and it, it seems like we had more shots on target five to their two we had more possessions 55 to their 45 but they looked way more dangerous they looked way more cohesive they looked way more like they had a plan um you know their attacking um formation or their attacking patterns made a lot of sense i've been a big fan of yates in midfield he carries and runs the ball very very well in there danilo is starting to settle in a bit more at the club as well gives white is becoming a big player and of course Ilanga after leaving United um, you know which I think was a bit hasty even though I wasn't the biggest fan of his I still think he would have been a decent squad player he definitely had a point to prove and he definitely proved it by giving the assist to um, Gibbs White to score the winner and in general the kind of real sort of alarming point about this game was just uh, another reminder of just how terrible Eric Ten Hag's in-game management is for some reason in the second half he decided tactically that Kobe Minor wasn't the right player to play as a single pivot against Nottingham Forest and their fucked dynamic attacking midfielders and attacking strikers and shit so instead he brought on McTominay McTominay was a person that he thought would be the one to kind of you know plug that hole in the center of midfield now I'm not saying Kobe Minor was impressive he wasn't that great but I still think he probably could have lended it to maybe take off an Ericsson or take off a Bruno and stick two of those players in front of the defenders instead of just swapping out one. Because the one thing about McTominay is that he goes wandering and he's not defensively disciplined to stay in that position. So he went wandering, wasn't defensively disciplined, bit naive, following the ball. And essentially that's what led to the second goal. And it was so obvious a turning point in the game even myself again a non-coach a random nobody could see that the moment Scott McTominay came on the pitch and we you know changed the the sort of formation of our midfield and the profile it immediately swung the favor into Nottingham Forest and what they were doing that's essentially what happened and even though they deserve to win um, I think if anybody was going to win that game it was definitely going to be Nottingham Forest they had a lot more I think attacking intent they, they knew kind of what they were doing they're trying to exploit some of our spaces and shit I still think that's substitution was so unnecessary so unneeded and if anything played in the hands of not in the forest that it was another illustration of just how terrible um eric ten Hag's tenure has been so far and the amount of losses that we've kind of racked up and the unfortunate records we're breaking now is just really really startling and it's starting to get worrying it's starting to get really worrying because you're starting to think to yourself why is he purposely making these mistakes again and again and again why is he betting on players who are not turning up for him why is he putting all these faith on people who have not shown any level of repaying that faith that he's putting them like even the Antonys even the you know even for lack of a better term even the rap the Rashfords right um the Bruno Fernandes 
um, the Scott McTominays, of course, all these players who consistently play for Man United, consistently play for Eric Ten Hag, but consistently keep letting him down, and he consistently keeps picking them. When the and we all know what the reality is. Sooner or later, these guys are gonna shit the bed if they haven't already, and then they're gonna cost him his job, and he will have no one else to blame. He will have absolutely no one else to blame. But again, a really shocking performance. Um, at the end, there was extra ten minutes added, and it didn't matter if they added another hour into that game. We were never gonna score from open play. It would have taken a, a fluky free kick or a penalty for us to level that game or even win it. It was never gonna happen. Terrible, terrible performance. And if anything, this two-one win. So this two-one loss away from home against Nottingham Forest was more representative of where we are at as a team as a football club than that rousing comeback win against Villa the rousing comeback win against Aston Villa was more so Villa playing into our hands and our players maybe feeling a little bit embarrassed um, and also maybe a little bit aware that the Ineos team were watching the team and stuff as opposed to us being a really fluid team the way we played against Nottingham Forest is more indicative of where we are at and if it was up to me if it was up to me and you had to ask me what I would wish for, I would actually wish for us to get relegated. I'm not going to lie. I would wish for us to get absolutely relegated so that the Glazers would leave and that we could start again from scratch. Because at the moment, I don't see any real light at the end of the tunnel. This 25% ownership thing with Enios is a hot, is a load of bullshit. The Glazers have been charged for what, near on two decades for anybody to sit there and believe that they're going to allow Ineos to have, you know, unfretted, unrivaled sporting decision, um, you know, responsibility on the club when they've been running the shots or calling the shots for 20 plus years is ludicrous. That's not going to happen. And if it is going to happen, it's going to take a long, long time for them to slowly, if but surely, relinquish control. Because if they relinquish control and take off the reins on the sporting side of success of the team and it is successful, all the praise will be going to Ineos and not to the Glazers and they don't want that they don't want to be told they're doing a bad job and they don't also want the people that are coming in and investing to get all the praise for it that's not going to happen I'm not I've got no faith in that and I'm not giving anyone the benefit of the doubt and I've always said with United unless we get rid of the Glazers the only other hope that we have of ever getting back to where we were previously is if we're able to maybe find another Sargis Ferguson level manager if we can find another SAF, which again is nigh on impossible, that's the only way that we're going to be able to get back to where we were. Other, other, apart from that, getting other managers and players and signings, it's going to be, it's a nonsense with these, with, with this ownership. It doesn't go anywhere because there's no accountability. There's no consequences. Um, and if anything, the objectives of the club aren't really, you know, aren't really sporting they're more commercial so it's no surprise that Eric Ten Hag is still in the job now because until we're mathematic sorry until we're mathematically out of the top four race he's going to be in the job as soon as he's out he's going to get sacked because they want to obviously um, make sure that we get top four football which again is to the detriment of the players to the detriment of the fans because we're going to have to watch turgid football until the moment that he leaves and the club's going to have to bleed itself dry until that time instead of making the decision now to kind of freshen things up again before the flipping summer window but we don't we're going to wait until the very last minute to pull the trigger which you know we would know it's going to happen he's a dead man walking so clearly that's the main issues going on at hand and of course you know as a manager to put him on one side of the favor of Eric Ten Hag his hands are tied behind his back because he also can't sell players as easily as many other managers and you know other top clubs can because the club has a weird way with how they deal with contracts with how they sell and um, obviously he can't maybe get all the targets that he wants which you know no, no manager does but it's very difficult if you want to play a certain way of football and you can't get your number one targets and you can't sell the players that can't play the football that you want so then you have to rely on them during the season when other players get injured and that creates a weird imbalance but one thing that I think is a really glaring glaring thing about Ayrton Hawks tenure so far has been his reluctance to rotate the squad and his reluctance to drop certain members of the team like, why does Bruno Fernandes start every single game? Why doesn't he ever come off as a substitute? Why has Onana never been dropped? Why? Why is that the case? Can people tell me? Why is that the case? Why does Anthony never get the same treatment that, you know, flipping Sancho was getting early on in the season when he was getting, you know, taken off every single game at a certain number of minutes? This is the reason that I think partly is going on at United that's kind of festering this bad, toxic environment at the club where certain players are allowed to get away with murder and certain players aren't. And, you know, if you're turning up to training every single week and you know certain players are going to play, what's the point of putting in your best effort? What's the point of putting in your best foot forward if you know most likely the same players are going to keep playing? Doesn't make any sense, does it? So whatever. Um, again, we go into the new year. 
um, you know, same shit as always with United. I don't really give a fuck. Um, let's see how it transpires. Let's see how it transpires. And then, of course, we've got news here courtesy of um, Sky Sports News with Ayrton Hogg. Really kind of doing my nutting at the moment. I really hate it when he talks to the press, to be fair. Um, he talks absolute bullshit. And I'm going to give him a bit of a bligh here because I think he's just trying to save himself. He's literally drowning. So he's saying anything. He's just waffling. But this headline really made my blood boil. It says Manchester United boss Ayrton Hogg claims injuries have been the key slump and says owners will show sympathy. This is absolutely diabolical thing to say really to be honest because part of the reason why we have so many injuries is because the manager refuses to rotate players he picks the same what 12 15 players every single time run them into the ground which obviously led to injuries and then um refuse to rotate and then of course more injuries right so what the fuck do you expect absolutely nonsense here um it says um the red devils had one da, 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 da. let's see what he says his quote here when asked to pinpoint the overarching reasons for united's poor campaign ten Hag told reporters the injuries which is done because every other team in the league has had injuries right every team in the league has had injuries also some injuries but mainly the injuries that hold us back in the process in january we have a lot of players returning so we then our levels can be higher the two players who are probably the main ones who are injured out now who probably would make a difference are casemiro and probably sandra martinez but before casemiro got suspended or got injured he wasn't really pulling up any trees and the same with Alessandro martinez right he was obviously carrying an injury might have not helped his form but let's not act like those two players are you know crazy crazy world class and they're going to change things for us especially if they're coming into a team that's already struggling so again we're doing the thing that united always do right we're doing the thing that united always fucking do where we always kind of wait for a savior so before it was luke shaw when he was injured and now all of a sudden it's going to be sandra martinez and fucking casemiro when they come back everything's going to be fine it's like no um he continues he says definitely David Brailsford will see we have problems. You want to build on the last result, but we have to change our striker. So he's now suggesting that Brailsford is going to have sympathy for him because of this injury. It's not true. If anything, your job should be on the line and should be in question because of how poorly and inconsistent we've, because of how consistently inconsistent we've been over the season. That's basically where you're not going to, you're not going to ever sack Ayrton Hart because of one result. You're going to sack him because of a pattern of inconsistencies. It's always one step forward, three steps back. And that's going to, what's going to end up costing him in his job, especially when it comes to his favoritism of picking certain players over others, which is absolutely crazy to be honest, especially when you consider most players are basically on the same level. Honestly, I can't stand Bruno Fernandes. I can't fucking stand him. I can't stand him. He's so fucking average. So shit. Um, let's continue here. It's clear that the results are very disappointing, says the Dutchman. We should have invested more in these moments. We created less before half time. We didn't do enough. The second half was better. He always says this. I don't know what game he watches. We didn't play well in the second half at all. I thought Nolan Throws played much better than us in the second half. If anything, we probably played a lot more better in the first half in terms of having more control of the game. I don't know what game he fucking watches. We are losing the game by a goal and you saw the fight in the team nonsense we had our chance the football in the second half was better we kept believing and going until the end but of course the result this we are disappointed the players are not happy with this result we have to do better we haven't played in the same team in a row we had to change again so every time we have to swap our team that doesn't help our support the routines of the team and it explains why it's so inconsistent no it doesn't to be honest if anything that that explains poor coaching the fact that we don't play a certain way, um, regardless of who plays, is a really startling, uh, you know, reflection of how poorly this team is coached. Because I don't understand what they do in training every single week. Because he says we have pattern and routines. What's the pattern and routine of our attack? Do we have a particular pattern and routine? Do we play a particular way? We got Hoyland up front sometimes playing. Do we cross the ball into him for him to run onto? Do we pop the ball over the top for him to run onto? Do we thread the, the, boo through, the ball through um, you know, defenders for him to run onto? Not particularly. Do we pass the ball out to the wings? Do we attack with our flipping attacking midfielders? Not really. Like, what are these patterns of play he's talking of? I don't know these patterns of play. If anything, we have more of a defensive shape and solidity. When it comes to attacking, I don't really see these patterns of play. That's probably part of the reason why myself and others are probably a super ten hog out because he sold us a dream when he was at Ajax. He's the greatest manager of catfish of all time. You know, he sold us a dream of this fast attacking, free flowing football. Then he comes to United and he's pragmatic um, and he's, you know, bending or changing his philosophy based on the shitty players that we have. And then, you know, and then we're also not winning. 
So it's one thing if we're playing terribly, but we're, we're, we're playing terribly and we're not winning. It's just, no, no, you can't. I'm not accepting that. It continues. We had nine different partnerships in the back. It doesn't matter as well. The fans don't want to hear this. They want to see us winning. And that is what we have to serve them. But that's a problem though. I think he's having, he's misunderstanding what's going on because I don't think any United fan with a brain is sitting here thinking that we should be winning the league. None. Well, no one's thinking that or even ch challenging for Champions League. We want to just see us, you know, evolving step by step, season in, season out. You want to see us flipping, you know, maybe at least playing an attacking brand of football and maybe developing every single season. That's basically it. Incre incremental kind of progress. This whole idea that we need to win at all costs is a nonsense because we're not winning and the winning at all costing, we've seen that happen before when we were under Jose and people didn't like that either, right? The football under Jose, especially towards the end, was kind of, was kind of shit, but we were still winning quite a few matches then. Um, when asked if he would like to talk to Ineos group, Ten Hag said, it will happen, no doubt about that. We'll work together to set high standards, of course, for achievement and structures. We'll talk about that. I don't think he has any right to have that conversation personally. I feel like he's, he should be playing for, he should be managing for his future. Maybe there's no need to get rid of him now because I don't want an interim manager. I don't want, you know, Fletcher and fucking Steve McLaren being managers and then going, having, because our fan base is fucking delusional and deluded and fucking too romantic. We have Fletcher and whatever and, you know, Steve McLaren be interim manager after Ayrton Hale gets sacked. They go on a good run of like five game win streak or something and all of a sudden the fans are calling for Fletcher to be at the wheel. I don't want that. I'd rather we just dog it out with fucking Ayrton Hogg, finish as low as we can, you know, get him out of the club at the end of the season, get those players at the end of the season and then kind of, you know, go back to fucking drawing board and figure out who's the coach that we want for the next project and how we're going to do it, blah, blah, blah. That's what I'd rather do. I'd rather just us all suffer with Ayrton Hogg for the time being than get an interim. That's garbage. No interim for me personally. I don't want that shit. Um, anyways, Anyways, and then of course, Gary Neville says here, yeah, Maynard are back to what they are, inconsistent and awful. They walk off the pitch, a defeated bunch. Maynard fans behind the goal, but God disappointed. Yeah, but hey, what can you do? Absolute bullshit. No surprise there. No fucking surprise. And then of course, um, I have to give a big shout out to Anthony Langer. Um, I felt like you know, as much as I wasn't the biggest fan of his, it's, you know, it, it is true that he didn't really get a fair shot, like a lot of players in our team who aren't starters. Um, if you don't start for this United team, especially under Eric Ten Hag, you might as well not exist, really. Um, he doesn't really, you know, focus on the players that he doesn't trust, really, to be honest. They're not really in his purview in the slightest. And especially when you can, when you can, but when you compare Anthony Langer to an Anthony and you think of what we spend on Anthony, um, it really does make you question you know, why the board or the team decided to go for Anthony or stick with Anthony and not, you know, try and maybe persist with maybe developing Ilanga. But Ilanga said um, post-match that it was personal for him. At United, I'll read some of the comments here. Nona Forest recorded a 2-1 victory over United. Um, he was causing Diego Dalot and Rafa Varane in particular constant problems and it was clear that the Swedish international was trying to prove a point to the manager who sold him. Um, speaking to NBC, the Swedish winger opened up about a tough season last year for the Red Devils as Ten Hag preferred Jadon Sancho and Anthony, um, Anthony over the academy graduate. Last season wasn't easy, he said, right? Um, for me because I'd play five to ten minutes then I wouldn't pay for ten games then it'll be in and out this game was kind of personal for me to prove that I'm capable of playing at the higher levels Elanga was certainly proving that blah 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 um, at higher levels assist for City Ground means that he has been involved in or either scored or assisting in ten of the of the East Midlands side goals so he's been involved in ten of the goals so far ever since he's gone you know he's, he's become a lot he's playing a lot more further up front sometimes a second striker sometimes on a wing and he's clearly pulling up a lot of trees but I feel like this statement is very indicative of the current mood of United I don't feel like there's probably a lot of players in our squad who feel the same way who feel like they probably don't get a fair crack of the whip um a good example is probably fucking donny van der beek for some reason he can't even get a single minute on the pitch but scott mctominay is always the first option to come off the bench to play which is horrendous because apart from his running and apart from his kind of fluky ability to score deflected goals in the box he's terrible with the ball at his feet he's a horrendous midfielder maybe one of the worst defensive midfielders i've ever seen play for united but he always consistently plays so imagine 
playing for a club like that where you know you're better than the other players playing but you don't get a chance to show it and if you do play you play once for five minutes and if you don't impress and you don't play like fucking Maradona you don't play again and that player plays before you all the fucking time it obviously doesn't help with your confidence and obviously leads to a weird probably imbalanced feeling in a dressing room where people feel like the places aren't earned really on merit and they're always a bit of favoritism going on there so um big up Anthony Langer really I'm happy for him to be honest um and it kind of goes to show that sometimes if you're a player because I'm sure he, if he wanted to he could have probably stayed and maybe you know maybe he's rotted at the bench and earned a nice little salary but at his age as well in his stage of development he's still got another big move in him do you know what I mean he could pull up a lot of trees at Nottingham Forest and still end up going to another top four club later on in his career two to three years down the line so it's good to see that he kind of betted on himself and now he's obviously reaping the rewards of it so big up Anthony Alanga big up Anthony Alanga um moving on from that moving on from that um let's talk about it randomly so i'm sure most of you don't know about this because it's mostly inside baseball techno news but unfortunately the last week um i saw this crazy news on my timeline about this guy that i follow on instagram and who also is part of a podcast called um das techno team um who goes by the name of life by kaizen also known as robert Maguire. unfortunately he passed away a week ago um when i saw it on my timeline i'm not gonna lie it kind of caught me you know off guard i was like jesus christos especially coming off the back of you know my the unfortunate passing of my friend as well um joshua sweeney recently it kind of seemed like wow man like you know you definitely could tell you're getting older when all these people around you some of them you know some of you don't know but you know people maybe within the same age bracket are all kind of passing away randomly it's like jesus christ um death is coming for us all in it not to be macabre but um the really sad thing about this is that I only found, I only found out about this guy what in the last couple of years I think mostly because of COVID. Um, if you don't know, he's kind of been you know he went a bit viral during the COVID era because of this um, iconic video of him dancing at a rave. You know, he's this big buff dude. Um, <sighs> dancing with a beret on topless somewhere in a raves in berlin in kiev in amsterdam and shit right during the lockdown mostly in it when it was peak covid times and shit right and he was kind of known for like kind of dancing cool and looking the way that he did da, da, da. and he was also part of a collective called drift kiev that did a lot of parties obviously in kiev and other parts of europe as well plus like berlin and whatnot right so kind of a man about town but then he was also part of this um podcast thing called Das Techno Team that I listened to a lot where you know it was a bit navel gazily and shit but I liked it because you know they took themselves very seriously they took, spoke a lot about clubbing shit and I would always kind of tune in and listen to it and obviously check out his Instagram from time to time so you know a little bit of a larger than life character um, I think he's originally from the UK who you know moved over to the um, Berlin a few years ago to obviously pursue a life of hedonism within the nightlife scene and he talks very openly he did talk very openly and very honestly about you know nightlife and the pros and cons of it and the drugs and the the you know whatever else it may be and from how he spoke he always seemed very very level-headed you know very level-headed and chilled he never really seemed like he was lost in the source for lack of a better term so it was surprising when i heard the news that he passed i'm not gonna lie because he always seemed like somebody that kind of had a handle on that shit and again I'm, I'm i'm assuming here i have no idea what the cause of death is so you know forgive me for that thing but if it is linked to that then that's obviously sad but the caption just like it caught me off cars like jesus christ man like imagine somebody who's like you know the life of the party who's very well known very plugged into the scene clearly a very very popular guy you know and the way you go out is like you know you're found basically unresponsive um in your own part in your own place by yourself type of thing it's just so tragic man really really gut-wrenching so um you know my thoughts and feelings go out to um robert Maguire, aka life by kaizen's family and friends out there who are probably you know i don't know what you guys are going through mourning that especially now you know towards the end of the year you know especially in berlin it's probably a big time now for everybody to be going out and celebrating and shit and capping off a big end of year with marathon parties and shit to not have this guy around who's obviously a mainstay in a lot of people's social groups and shit it's going to live a really really big hole um, but let me read the caption here from one of his friends it says our beloved 
our dear and beloved brother, friend, colleague, Robert Maguire, life by Kaizen was found unresponsive at his flat on Monday evening. We are shocked and devastated by this news. We will share more information when possible. At the moment, we ask for your respect and grief of the family and friends. Please pray for his soul and celebrate the life of our angel for his wonderful impact on the world and our hearts. We will remember him forever. So really, really sad. And as you can see, many, many, um, you know, um, tributes out there from him from loads of uh, people here another one person here says too good for this world an absolute force of positive nature you left your mark on everyone that came into contact with your aura godspeed my dear friend i will never forget you or your love my dear friend another person says after coming back from this post i must say how wonderful it is to read so many beautiful comments and for some recollections it really shows how special he was to so many people and left a heart and an impact on so many people's lives a soul like this will be missed but we must celebrate the moment shared together rest in peace rob um, another person says condolences to his family in total shock let this be a reminder that life can end at any moment no matter your age and how much of a good person you are another one says r.i.p rob i remember him giving me a tip of 10 euros whilst i was working at a wardrobe in a place called cloutus hail was that culture culture house killy he told me you deserve it it's because you shine like a light and now we will also remember him as one my condolences to all friends and his family unique and beautiful i met robbie once but this kind of person left unforgivable spot in my memory he spread love and kindness and acceptance this is the kind of person with which you want to spend more time and accept the knowledge of oh my god this is too much love you robbie and yeah and so forth and so forth so it's good to see you know the touching tributes people leaving for him clearly the guy was an angel the guy was a saint in real life right people actually actually liked him um and he came across very very well but it is definitely a stark reminder of you know what it what that what that lifestyle is again i have no idea what the cause of death is so i'm just you know i'm talking out my ass here but you know this is just the reality of the situation um there is no there's no kind of beating around the bush, you know, there is no real beating around the bush around it when it comes to this sort of stuff. Like, you know, the unfortunate dark side of nightlife is what it is. The, you know, when it's good, it's good. When it's bad, it's fucking bad. But, you know, it's, it's really sad to see somebody like this. So again, through the podcast, mainly listening to him, who really had a good handle on his outlook on the, on, you know, on nightlife, who kind of spread good vibes, had really good insights around it and shit. And was always somebody who I felt like, um, was really spreading a good message out there. And it's really unfortunate that his life got cut short. So RIP to Robert Maguire, RIP to Robert Maguire, force and feelings go out to his family and friends. I really can't, you know, imagine what they're kind of going through at the moment. And yeah, man, prayers to every everybody involved prayers to everybody involved really really prayers and it kind of makes me think a little bit about um you know messages i've been receiving from people and stuff you know behind the scenes about stuff going on in the industry and shit and it's like it really makes you wonder how people are able to operate within the industry day to day and without getting crazy because there's so much horrible fuck shit going on and again big up everybody who does ever reach out to me you know if you want to unburden yourself of whatever you're going through feel free because i'm you know i'm never going to repeat anything to anybody else or share it in public because you know <laughs> there's no friends around here for me to gossip about these things with so i'll just share them you know vaguely here on the pod but the things that are going on behind the scenes with some, with some people like you would honestly it would, it, it would make you cry it would make even a guy like me a hardened thug of a guy like me fucking weep at the stuff that's going on behind the scenes and the scene and shit so the ones who are out there who are fighting a good fight who are you know out there for the good reasons who are out there for the right reasons spreading joy spreading the music want to dance connect with people find love whatever you're doing you know I don't I commend you I really do commend you because every single day you are literally rolling a dice with your life and shit you know vis-a-vis -vis your lifestyle vis-a-vis -vis the people around you vis-a-vis -vis the situations you get put in so really strength and power to everybody out there in the industry who is making a career for themselves out there because nightlife is no game and it's no fucking game and I keep thinking about it all the time when I was younger, my parents would always say to me, because, you know, I was a bit rebellious and I always wanted to go out, you know, always wanted to be at raves and shit. And they were really conservative and really wanted me to stay in and shit and be reading the Bible all every day. And obviously didn't want that. But something they always say and they would always stick to me and it's always stuck with me now is, you know, 
nothing really good happens after 9 p.m. And that's a fact, really and truly. Like, as much as I love night nightlife, like, nothing really good happens after 9 p.m. And it really is a land, you know, you really are surrounding yourself with fucking demons and heathens when you're out there after 9 p.m. So, um, you know, mind your P's and Q's, um, stay solid, you know, check your square, make sure your flipping crew is legit and obviously call out all the fuck shit and enjoy yourself in it because you know um nothing in life is guaranteed unfortunately nothing in life is guaranteed moving on quickly we're going to talk about this as well regarding the amazon prime video will start showing ads on january 29th no surprise there right no bloody surprise so this is Curse of the verge movies and tv shows and amazon streaming service will start getting broken up with ads in january unless they're willing unless you're willing to pony up an extra fee for each month so if you stay on the current fee which i guess is what 8.99 in the uk for amazon prime video um you're gonna get ads and I guess the bump up won't get you no ads. Maybe it's like fourteen ninety nine. Let's see here. Courtesy of The Verge, earlier this year, Amazon announced plans to start incorporating ads into movies and TV shows streamed on its Prime Video service. And now the company has revealed the specific date that you will start seeing them is January 29th. The quote, this will allow us to continue investing in compelling content and keep increasing that investment over a long period of time. We aim to have meaningful fewer ads that than linear TV and other streaming TV providers. No action is required from you. There is no charge for the current price of your prime membership. The company wrote customers have the option of paying an additional two ninety nine per month to keep avoiding advertisements. So that will bring you up to what? That will bring you up to 11 basically 12.99 right the rest of the email summarizes the main benefits of prime subscription so the funny thing about this you know what i've i've figured out number one the amazon prime video ui ux whatever is terrible right it's not the best it there's a decent amount of stuff on there you know i quite like their offerings to be fair at a stretch i'm gonna say amazon prime video probably has a lot more stuff that i'm into than netflix maybe at a stretch i know it's a stretch to say that but i think so but the thing that I think that's really interesting about this. This goes to show when it comes to subscription services, there is really a ceiling of how much money you can make with this sort of stuff. Because the people who have Amazon Prime membership subscriptions now, that's basically it. You're not really going to acquire many new paid users. You're not going to acquire enough to make you profitable, which is why they increase prices. So if anything, it's proof that all these things that they do in terms of, you know, developing and investing into new shows and shit all it does is it's more so an effort to keep the fans or keep the subscribers you have as opposed to acquire new ones because the people who don't have amazon prime are never going to get it anyway especially at this point in time if you don't have a netflix now why would you suddenly get one now you know there's no real um incentive for you to get it if you are you know watching shows another way or you have other options so clearly for me this is an example that there's always a bit of a ceiling when it comes to subscription services um which is sad because it does show that this is the reason why we probably don't get compelling you know um shows and shit because they can't really make enough money to justify investing in the compelling shows so they go with the safe bets or they don't go with any bets and they just kind of keep ramping up the fucking subscriptions um fees and you have to end up paying more for less which is what you're doing with Netflix, right? Netflix has kind of gone up over the years and obviously Amazon Prime are doing the same thing as well going forward. So it's an unfortunate state of affairs at the moment. Um, but again, it's more proof that if anything, for me personally, I think the most bang for of my buck that I've got from a subscription has definitely been Amazon Premium. Sorry, um, YouTube Premium. YouTube Premium has definitely been the best subscription service that I've signed up to in the last, what? five years or so um as you know as opposed to anything else out there from hulu to hbo to fucking bt sport to netflix and shit um, youtube has definitely been the best subscription service i've kind of signed up to the be ability to listen to that stuff in the background um it's obviously number one to download clips and shit. All this stuff is definitely something that I've kind of been using ad nauseum, especially because I'm on YouTube fucking every single day anyway. So it definitely has been the best one for me when it comes to that sort of stuff. So big up YouTube premium. Next, we've got news courtesy of Variety regarding some unfortunate layoffs at Condé Nast. So um, solidarity and love and support to my Condé Nast and Vox media employees out there. It says... um. 
let's see here here it says the job cuts at Condé Nast come after the company said earlier this month that it will lay off upwards of 300 employees representing five percent of the total headcount that other um, cost reduction measures it's not immediately clear where these areas of the company are affected of the current round of layoffs sources insisted that there is no layoffs at Vanity Fair on Thursday but there's maybe coming in the next few days in the post on X Puck Media reporter Dylan Byers wrote that the company layoffs will affect staffers at the New York um, at the New Yorker which is rare Vanity Fair and most other titles Condé Nast reps declined to comment and the New York Times company stable of brands includes the New Yorker blah blah blah, blah. in November the first company memo Condé Nast CEO Robert Lynch said the layoffs will take place over the next few months that the company will offer affected employees I wonder what is the role behind this in terms of always firing people before the holidays because I know for me, I, I've, it's happened to me a couple of times where I've been laid off, you know, as part of a huge company-wide layoff. And it's always happened before Christmas. It's fucking brutal for you, obviously, the employee. But I wonder why companies opt to go for laying off people towards the end of the year as opposed to the start of the year. Like, I don't know. I think I would prefer to go. I'd, I'd prefer to live in ignorance and bliss going through Christmas into New Year and then get fired at the beginning of the year as opposed to the end. But I'm sure there's a business clever way why they do it at the end of the year. Probably, um, maybe it's maybe it's a way to kind of fob the fucking um, balance sheets or something, um, because it accounts for Q4 and it doesn't bleed into Q1. I don't really know, but I'm really curious as to why most companies, um, you know, of um, kind of opt to go for layoffs before Christmas because I don't know, man, that shit hurts, bro when you're you know you have all these elaborate plans for christmas you want to buy gifts you want to party you want to eat and shit and then you get told hey you know you're out and then you're like shit okay i gotta tighten the belt now until i find a new gig it's like fuck you now there's nothing worse honestly there's literally nothing worse um they up quite in the chat Colin said is oh okay Colin's saying is to avoid giving a bonus that makes a lot of sense to be fair I guess because I haven't worked in places in most startups I work in, they don't really have bonus schemes, but I think most companies um, probably do, or most corporate companies probably have an incentive structure um, that, you know, that leads into the end of the year. So if you get people, get rid of people before the end of the year, you only have to pay them their salary and no bonus and shit. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to be fair. Again, you know, Big up capitalism, isn't it? Big up fucking capitalism. So again, um, thoughts and feelings go out to my people out there at Condé Nast and Vox Media. Um, hold your head up, people. Hold your head up. Um, things will get better. I promise you things will get better. Moving on to this one. This is an interesting um, article courtesy of The Telegraph, which I saw all across social. So I had to kind of talk about this because I was really surprised. But so I'm not going to lie. It says here, courtesy of The Telegraph, Swiss cocaine is so cheap and widely used, they're considering legalizing it. Um, I always assumed Switzerland was a very um, expensive place to live, expensive place to visit. So I just assumed things like drugs were being expen incredibly expensive. Like I remember somebody telling me, you know, drugs in Australia and shit are incredibly expensive because of how expensive it is to live in there. So I just assumed the same thing with Switzerland. So I'm surprised to hear that it's actually really cheap that it is accessible to the point where they want to legalize it. Really wild, isn't it? It's really the article. It says Switzerland's capital is considering legalizing cocaine after admitting the war on drugs has failed. Bern is weighing up a pilot scheme to allow the sale of class a narcotics to for recreational use a radical approach which is thought to be a worldwide first switzerland was one of the first so switzerland has one of the highest levels of cocaine use in europe according to levels of licit drugs and their metabolic measured in the wastewater with zurich basel and geneva all featuring in the top 10 cities did you hear that Zurich, Basel and Geneva all feature in the top 10 cities in Europe with the highest amount of cocaine users. Jesus Christos. Prices of the drug have halved in the country in the last five years, according to the Addiction Switzerland, and usages are rising. Some politicians and experts are criticized complete bans as an effective means of addressing the crisis. I guess this makes a lot of sense um, with Zurich or Switzerland being the finance capital of Europe and shit, right? And a lot of business guys partying there and shit so it makes a lot of sense that business guys and you know whatever finance dudes would be into drugs like cocaine it's definitely something that a lot of those people in that scene like and the funny thing is because i guess um 
there's no one else there that kind of does it they can explore these methods but i've always thought to myself that the war on drugs was always a little bit dumb and it, unfortunately it costs a lot of lives especially in places like central america and south america and the really way to kind of eliminate the war on drugs and to kind of make sure people you know aren't dying um un, you know in unfortunate circumstances because of people's you know desire to get that drug flipping smuggled into parts of europe would be to legalize it especially the same way that portugal have done it because i think portugal's way of doing legalization is essentially saying anything up to 3.5 grams is for personal use and it essentially kind of you know takes away all the need of you know people violence all that sort of shit because it's i wouldn't say it's i think i think that's what it is it's kind of legalized and not legalized and it kind of you know allows people to buy stuff um safely um and obviously get stuff tested and whatever it may be and that might be the best way to kind of deal with these situations but i'm legitimately shocked more so that switzerland is that high up the list because i always assumed the uk would definitely be far up the list in terms of cocaine use especially on a daily basis um it continues here we have a lot of cocaine in switzerland says here the cheapest prices and the highest quality we have ever seen and we can get the dose of cocaine for about 10 francs to these days not much more than the price of a beer so but that's that's a bit um that's a bit i don't i'm not too sure if that's right because what's a dose mean a dose isn't a gram does that mean like a bump or a line because if a line is 10 francs that's still quite a lot in it right what um 10 francs 10 francs in pounds is 10 pounds so what I did, it's nine pounds 33 so a single line of coke in switzerland is nine pounds <laughs> that's still kind of expensive to be fair to be you know what i mean that's not cheap um so it says here the highest the cities with the highest amounts wow i'm really surprised i'm not gonna lie the number one city with the highest traces of cocaine in the wastewater so that's obviously the sewage number one is barcelona number two is zurich number three is antwerp in belgium number two is saint gallen i guess that's probably in belgium as well geneva switzerland bristol uk amsterdam um and obviously basel Bern, and dortmund london isn't even in the top 10 that is surprising. London isn't in the top 10. Wow, that's really surprising. Bristol's not surprising though because it's like a, you know, it's a university town. It's a bit of a party town also. Not a lot of clubs there, but a lot of great bars and pubs and whatever it may be. So I'm not surprised that kind of culture lives free there. And there's a lot of like hippy dippy people there and obviously people with money. So that makes a lot of sense. It continues here. Cocaine prices have fallen because the market is flooded with a large amount of the drug. In 2022, more than 160 tons of cocaine were confiscated in Antwerp and Rotterdam alone. Much more getting to europe i guess maybe it makes sense why zurich is so high up in it especially with it being a port right with it being near, near ports and shit because you think about barcelona also right they have you know they're basically surrounded by water essentially so you can effectively get quite a lot of good shit smuggled in there that would make a lot of sense with all the stuff even bristol bristol's not a really good example but i'd imagine all these places barcelona zurich antwerp st gallen and geneva are all probably near decent ports which is probably why they get a lot of good cocaine in and why the prices are so low because a lot of the good stuff gets through yeah i'm assuming so um while prices have dropped purity has increased in switzerland 70 to 80 percent of the substances sold are now pure cocaine jesus christ 70 to 80 which is definitely not how it is in the uk even weed in the uk is fucking boshed and smashed a bit so you know i'd, I'd say in the uk even if it was weed you're probably 50 50 in terms of um purity really are and the guys that do sell good weed are definitely the ones that are in demand and they charge the most because you know they're the ones that don't fuck about with their product the most but anything in the uk you get especially in london is bashed to shit but because there's no other options you just buy it anyway so you overpay for drugs here and the quality is terrible um unfortunately from what i've heard um legalization can do uh, many european countries including spain italy and portugal no longer impose prison sentences for possession of cocaine which is highly addictive but nowhere has gone as far as legalized the plan will require existing national law banning recreational use of the drug to be changed but burns parliament supports the scheme which could follow trials underway to permit the legal sale of cannabis the war on drugs has failed the quote says and we have to look at new ideas says eva chen the member of burn um alternative left party control and legalization can do better um than re mere repression i definitely agree with that 100 percent 
agree with that. And of course, look at this. Britain has the worst cocaine habit in the UK. Cocaine use in the last 12 months among people aged 15 to 64 year olds doing coke. That's when you know your life is bleak, isn't it? If you're still doing bumps at home at 64, fuck, that's bleak, isn't it? So anyway, um, the top countries, Australia, United Kingdom second, Austria third, Spain fourth, United States fifth. And then that's a strong top five, isn't it? And then you've got Ireland, Netherlands, Canada, Croatia, France, and Denmark. That's a strong top five. And if anything, is that also evidence that these are the top two are some of the worst um, tourists as well? No? Isn't that also evident? Some of the worst tourists are australians and brits right and they also happen to be the people who do the most gear that's fucking crazy australians and, and british or uk people are some of the worst tourists out there right every country hates them when we come around and we also happen to do the most fucking gear absolutely fucking crazy um but yeah i've always been for the legalization of class a drugs in general i just think if you're going to do stuff you might as well do stuff in a safe environment where you're able to easily get stuff tested where the where where it's in where you it's encouraged for you to have where it's encouraged to sell good stuff because it's legal you know and you sell bad shit obviously no customers are going to be buying your shit and obviously more so just because of the amount of death around drugs and shit right do you know what i mean like there's so much bloodshed around the smuggling and the importation of fucking cocaine and other class H substances that i just don't think the you know the war on drugs is worth it because so many you know quote-unquote innocent people die because of it it's really horrible and i just think in general as destructive as drugs are we all know they're horrible especially alcohol i just feel like you should have your own life you should be able to make your own decisions but i feel like for some reason we're infantilized in the world you saw a lot happening in, in the, you know, around the Western world, especially when COVID happened. There was a refusal for certain governments to just, I wouldn't say natural to let them, you know, to let nature run its course, but there was this insistence that everybody was going to get saved. And that wasn't the case, right? So unfortunately, some people would get COVID, you know, and it'd be a mild cough. Some people wouldn't even get it or some people would get it and wouldn't notice it. Some people would flip and have their lungs taken out of their body and end up fucking passing away. Um, but you couldn't save everyone. Everybody had to kind of take their own risk in their own hands. And I feel like the same thing should be said for drugs. It should all be legalized. And if you want to do it, do it. But you know what the risks are. You know, that basically should be how it should go about. But then I think about the UK and I think about how uncouth and how just crazy we are as a country. And I think if they legalize stuff like Coke in the UK, this place will turn into fucking Gomorrah overnight. Like <laughs> it's probably the worst thing ever to do in this country. Like as much as I love this place, as much as I will always fight for my people, legalizing something like cocaine in the UK would be the literal end of us as a civilization. It would not be a good idea because we can't even handle our booze, right? We can't even handle going to Weatherspoons and ordering cocktails and shit and fish and chips. Imagine if you were allowed to fucking carry a baggie in your pocket everywhere you went. God almighty, God almighty, this country would literally explode, would literally rip apart at the seams. So maybe it's for the better, um, it's for the best, you know, that these things are illegal, quote unquote illegal, because if you want them, you can obviously still get a hold of them if you, you know, have a little bit of a brain but i think overall in the long term if you do want to win the war on drugs just legalize everything man legalize it all um you know obviously improve um drug safeties um education all this malarkey and just allow people to make grown-up decisions like allow people to make their own decisions of what they want to do and if they decide to you know um indulge themselves head first in a you know in a flipping pyramid size um amount of coke then let them do so if not then it is what it is but i feel like there needs to be a lot more maturity around that conversation and less fucking scrutinization but you know yeah the, the less said about that the better because i don't think it will end the way i think it would end you know <laughs> anyway moving on from that one we got this article, Hertz of Sky News. This is absolutely hilarious, right? Big up fucking Chiara Ferragini. Chiara Ferragini. I know of this lady because during my time working at Depop, um, she was one of the top D 
Depop influencers. She had a Depop store and she would legitimately move units. Like, and obviously accordingly, um, the company would obviously move mountains to accommodate her. And I think because I did a lot of work in marketing, a lot of work in influencer marketing, content creation and shit, this was the first sort of influence I, I remember stumbling across in my professional working career who actually sold stuff. Because there's a lot of influencers out there who are just all image right they have the image online they have the followers and shit but when it comes to actual numbers when it comes to signups when it comes to you know um you know user acquisition when it comes to you know checkouts and stuff and selling products they don't actually move any units whatsoever but this chiara woman was definitely one of the people that i remember thinking oh shit she actually is what she is on the fucking social media very popular people trust her opinion when she's selling a certain thing on her depop so everyone would fucking flock to it whatever 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 well this headline is fucking hilarious it says chiara Fer Fer ferangi or how you say chiara ferangi Ferangni, Chara Ferangni, um, let's call her Chara, um, apologizes after misleading fans with a sale of a charity Christmas cake. Imagine this. This is fucking hilarious. So, Italian fashion designer, sorry, Italian fashion influencer Chiara um, has apologized after misleading her followers over the sale of a Christmas cake. The 36 year old who bought her platform through her fashion and beauty um, Chiara brand said she will donate 1 million euros to a children's hospital after fans were led to believe that buying a, for a, a Chiara branded Pandoro similar to a Panetto they were contributing to the charity. In a video apology to her near 30 million Instagram followers, the influencer admitted that there had been a communications error. <laughs> I love that term for a scam, communications error, after being fined by the Italy's competition watchdog. In reality, um, Bolocco, the company who makes the cake, had made a one-off 50,000 no, 50, euro payment to the Regina Margarita, a Turin-based um, pediatric hospital, months before launching the competition in collaboration with Chiara. So this, you know, so basically, hey, buy my cake and the proceeds will go to charity. But the truth was the donation was already made and anything that she made from the cake, she pocketed. Because obviously, if you say you're going to donate money to charity um, through the sale of a cake, people obviously maybe will buy more of the cake to support the charity, right? Um, <laughs> it's such an unnecessary scam, but it also is kind of an evidence or a indication of just how brazen and soulless and dark this woman must be to run this sort of scam just imagine the stuff that she's gotten away with if this is what she's doing because it's so unnecessary um but obviously it's proof that the greed is strong it continues i realize i've made a communications error a communications error um, my error in good faith was to link via communications a commercial activity with a charity one the influencer was hit with criticism over the incident, including an Italian Prime Minister, um, Giorgia Meloni. Um, without directly mentioning Chiara, Miss Meloni, the real models to follow are not the influencers who make a lot of money by wearing clothes and showing bags or even promoting expensive cakes that make people believe they are charitable. Businesses run by the mother of two were issued a 1.5 million euro fine by antitrust authority AGCM. Chiara said that she would appeal the fine, calling it disproportionate and unjust and said that she were just to get a reduction on her fine she would top up her donation with a sum equivalent to that discount the one million donation she voluntarily is making is the same amount Fiaragi, um, made from the promotion of the competition the cake company has handed a four hundred and twenty thousand euro fine so imagine that you sell a cake and um, you know declaring that the proceeds will go to fucking charity none of them go to charity you pocket it and you only get rum and she only admitted it because she got found out by, by the way so don't give her any fucking props or claps or adulation for it she got fined that's why she fucking admitted it and even now she's saying it's not true and is contesting it and appealing it and wants to get the fine fucking reduced but it is kind of proof of just how scummy the influencer scene is in general because these people make crazy amounts of money doing absolutely nothing anyway right and usually you can make a lot of money doing nothing if you just kind of double down on doing nothing but then when you start fucking scamming and start fucking skimming here and there it's just so unnecessary but also kind of reveals how 
duplicitous and just dark-hearted and cold that you are to go that far because she already makes a lot of money she already has a great following why would you need to you know embellish this whole story and say you want to fucking you know donate the money from the cake sales to a charity when it's already been donated and all the money from the cake sales that you made goes straight to your pocket it's absolutely horrendous really but also another reminder that charity really you know if you want to contribute to a charity do it yourself directly you know find one yourself do make make the effort to do and do a bit of leg work to find the charities um and support the cause that you want to support but doing them through these influencer type things which are easy to do and they're a bit maybe they're a bit of a dopamine hit to make you feel like a good person because you already follow her and you, you want to do something nice so you kind of want to give back to a children's charity whatever it may be that's tied to the cake that you already like as well but i think making the extra effort to actually donate yourself to a charity is a far better way to spend your money or to use your resources and to really touch the people that need to be touched as opposed to funneling it through the hands of an already rich influencer because unfortunately as she's shown it's really hard not to resist the allure of scamming once that money hits your Shopify, once it hits your PayPal, it's probably really hard to decide, okay, I'm going to send that to the charity. It's probably easier just to say, withdraw my account. Um, so it's probably for the best to not give them that debt temptation and just donate the money directly to the charities that you actually support and you like. That's probably the best way to do it, I would assume. That's the, probably the best way to do it, I would assume. Next on the list. What else do we have here? I want to talk about with you guys quickly. Bada bing, bada boom. Of course, if you're enjoying the show, make sure you smash the like button down below. That would be greatly appreciated. Oh, yeah. um, The Banksy artwork that was stolen less than an hour after unveiling. Yo, big up the guy that stole the artwork. Absolute goon. Absolute goon. Um, This is, to me, the antithesis of guerrilla marketing. And this is very UK coded. So, courtesy of the Guardian, Banksy artwork stolen less than an hour after unveiling in South London. Um, Two men have been filmed um taking an artwork created by banksy from the south london street less than an hour after it was confirmed by uh, as a genuine installation the artist confirmed the piece a traffic stop sign covered with a free aircraft said to resemble military drones and um, was his in a social media post shortly after midday on friday in a video shared on social media onlookers watch as two men are seen to be taking down the sign at the intersection of southampton way and commercial way in peckham about 12 30. let's play a bit of the clip here absolutely brilliant by the way i love that he's also wearing i think it's like a junior coat or something right and some fucking margellas as he's taking down this sign and everyone's watching and obviously british people are like oh my god not saying anything and not fucking calling the police just standing there watching him he takes it down really quickly to be fair right off and runs <laughs> what a goon what a goon. Straight in his car? What a goon. What an absolute goon. Um, continuing on in the video, show, da, 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 witnesses can be heard saying, oh my God, um, on the soundtrack of the video as one of the men takes a stop sign and runs off with one woman saying, it makes me so annoyed. The deputy leader of Suffolk Council, Jasmine Ali, said the artwork should not have been removed. We'd like it back so everyone community can enjoy it. So obviously that's the artwork. Really cool to be fair. I'm not going to lie. The three drones over the stop sign, a really cool little piece there. But of course, the update here, we live in fucking snitch, the snitch nation of fucking Europe. Europe. Um, it says man arrested on suspicion of the theft of the sign and another update is that a second man has been arrested so two of the guys involved in the theft I'm assuming the guy that was holding the bike for him to jump up and obviously the guy that took the sign have probably been arrested and yeah I'm assuming the artwork's probably been returned as well, right? Let's actually read the article. It says, A second man has been arrested on suspicion of the theft and the criminal damage after the removal of the Banksy artwork. The piece, a red stop sign with the military drones on it, appeared at the intersection of Southampton Way. Banksy confirmed his credentials just after midday. Scotland Yard said the man in his 40s had been arrested on Sunday and his police custody. Another man in his 20s is detained. Police said the latter had been bailed um, per the spending, um, pending further inquiries. Personally, I think he should just leave them alone and let them take the thing. This is basically more, 
you know, Banksy's doing more for the local community there in Southwark or in Peckham than the fucking government is, especially the local council. Whoever took that fucking piece could probably sell it on and maybe, you know, be able to kind of hold themselves down for the rest of the year. The cost of living has gone up here in the UK, make a good, pretty, a pretty bit, of, you know, pretty bit of money. And this will end up in a gallery somewhere in fucking, you know, in Berlin or maybe in Brixton somewhere and, er and everything will be good anyway. I think just let leave them alone. Let them fucking take the thing. Um, I like the fact that Banksy makes these public artworks, these public pieces of work that, you know, the, the regular people on the street can fucking interact with and they're not all hoisted up in some sterile, white, um, LED-filled room somewhere behind a fucking wired, um, be be behind some sort of steel wire, right? They're out in public so you can touch, smell and see it. And it's good that he does that. And also, if he does it on things like this, you can have local people decide to fucking nick it and sell it in order to fucking help and support their family, especially with the cost of living crisis happening in the uk so i would have much preferred to have seen these guys enjoy it celebrate it and kind of support their family with it but of course the uk is bad vibes everybody's snitching everybody's saying oh my god and fucking clutching their pearls so you know free the guys who stole the sign i'm sure banksy doesn't mind and hopefully they get out soon they did absolutely nothing wrong they did absolutely nothing wrong that's my humble opinion on that one but hey i could be wrong I could be wrong. Doubt it, but I could be. You never know. I fucking could be. Um, moving on from that, I quickly want to talk about this. Where is it? Bear with me a second. Where is it? Well, then I put it on here. Hmm. Ba, 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 ba. Cool. So, um, I watched Saltburn. Have you watched Saltburn? I watched Saltburn over the weekend and I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, Jacob LLD, incredible performance from him. Um, I don't know, like, again, maybe it's just acting, you know, when you're an actor, you can do whatever. But he, the way he was able to play the role of that sort of like, you know, um, rich, upper class British guy thing for, in uni was incredible like we've all seen character well we, you know if you're from the uk you you would know somebody like that right who kind of comes from money um and just you know just floats through life with this certain ease and laissez-faire that you you know money can't really buy it's something you have to kind of be born into and jacob elodie played that role so well so so well man like honestly the way he just did it i'm not too sure how he was able to kind of you know in personify it maybe because that's where he's from originally maybe that's his background also com coming up even though it's in australia i'm sure they have um, a very posh side of things over there as well but he played that role of the ultra rich posh kid incredibly well um but wow what an incredible movie um more so because of how it was a reflection on society really right the need for us to all play our own individual roles for the betterment of our collective story or experience kind of thing right because the guy um what's his name the other dude what's his flipping name i forgot okay jacob ellery and the other one what's his name let me get his name if i remember I forget. um the guy called oliver quick right played by gary um barry keogan or Keogan, how you pronounce his name he basically plays a role of a um, student that gets a that gets a place in oxford university through some sort of like scholarship schemes type of thing and they've used they've been doing this quite a lot recently in the in, in the last few years because they want to obviously increase the amount of people who come from regular society going to all those kind of privileged universities but i'm assuming if you do go to cambridge or, you, or oxford and you do get in through these kind of you know these fucking um these programs and shit as great as it is for um as great as it is for representation it's probably not the best experience day to day because everybody knows that you kind of didn't get in through merit right you kind of got in because of a you know you had to tick a box type of thing so it can kind of be a bit weird but anyway he's going through that struggle of trying to find himself you know as a young man and of course he kind of crosses path with um jacob elodie's character called felix who's very self-assured very popular um and just seems to have everything kind of figured out and clearly comes from money as well and it's basically a story where um the barry 
Kyogen character, Oliver Quick, essentially tries to, um, and successfully does anyway, uh, make himself a part of Felix, Jacob Elodie's family. And because he wants a better life for himself, so he invents this whole different narrative about his upbringing, about his life, whatever it may be, um, to make those people like him more. And it continues this weird relationship and it kind of ends in this really crazy way. But I really enjoyed it. I'm not going to lie. I really fucking enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was a really amazing portrayal of how quickly you can go from admiration um, to pure obsession, right? That it went very, very fast in that regard. Um, I thought it was really cool how they looked at manipulation, how they looked at toxicity, um, and just everything included it was so fucking amazing i'm not gonna lie i really did enjoy it and i'm not really the type that enjoys a lot of these art house indie films that talk about emotions too much because i'm obviously not in touch with my in touch sorry with my emotions but i did find myself captivated by this movie and the performances in it um young old vibes no it's available on amazon prime video that's why i watched it on it's available on Amazon Prime Video. Um, that's why I watched it on, but I'm sure you can find other places. But I really did enjoy it. Available on Amazon Prime Video. Um, it's called Saltburn. Um, I'm sure most of you have probably heard about it already, especially because of the um, explicit um, sexual scenes that are very unconventional. Let me just tell you that. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but they're very unconventional sexual scenes, which are really, which I think in isolation, if you see them beforehand and you get spoiled, they don't make sense. But when you actually watch the movie, they make a lot of sense, you know, if that makes if that makes any sense. Like if you see the images in isolation, it's a bit out there. But when you actually see the sex scenes um, in context of the movie, it makes all the sense in the world. I really did fucking enjoy it. And again, it goes from brotherhood to romance, to pure lust, um, to obsession, um, you know, to class structure. It's just a really amazing, 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 amazing movie. And I really do implore you to check it out if you haven't already. I really do implore you to check it out if you haven't already. Next, 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 next. I also have been watching Time Season 2. So this is a UK-based drama. Um, it's around the prison system in the UK. The first season kind of i forgot what they're centered around basically it was a guy that got into prison because of a, i forgot anyway but basically the, the general premise of it is it follows three two or three different people and how they got to prison and usually it kind of follows somebody that maybe happened there hap, you know kind of got their way to prison because of a unlucky circumstances somebody that's a career criminal and obviously somebody that's maybe really you know that's kind of you know been ruled out of life and shit because they got a life sentence so it kind of followed those kind of free trajectories and i think season two was probably one of the best ones in that it starts off so normal like the the person that basically gets in prison the most the main person it starts off like a normal day and it just quickly quickly spirals and it's a really good depiction of how the prison system can break seemingly decent people and basically confine them to a life of misery and it really did a good job of kind of depicting that whole entire story and kind of showing it in um without being too dark without being too graphic unnecessarily just showing how miserable that must be and the destruction it causes for people outside that's what i think it does a really good job of as well it does a really good job of showing the um the consequences of people's impulsive decisions in the moment that lead to them getting to prison and how that can negatively affect their family and friends and um one of the things you hear a lot about them people saying a lot when it comes to prison is that when you first get in especially if you're somebody that got in because of a you know maybe you had loads of parking tickets and you get in right like a really you know a really um a really kind of minor thing they always say that in the beginning of your sentence everybody visits you everyone's right into you you're getting loads of money put on your books and then little by little the visits dry up the mail dries up as does the fucking money on your books and it's a representation of people basically moving on with their lives and choosing to kind of just you know ignore you and just focus on their lives while you kind of have to suffer what you're suffering through and you kind of see that you know obviously um, depicted in this series called time so if you're a fan of um prison um you know, T 
TV series and stuff concerning, you know, I guess a more of a thriller um, type of thing, I really recommend you check out Time. Um, there's obviously two seasons of it. It's available on BBC iPlayer. If you're not in the UK, I guess you have to find it on another platform to watch because I don't think iPlayer is available outside of the UK. But it's called Time, season one and season two, um, both out now at the moment. Season one focuses on the men's prison. Season two focuses on the women's prison. And the women's prison one was really good. Um, maybe not as good as the men's prison one, but it definitely did. Um, um, hold my attention throughout the entire time that I watched it so I definitely recommend you check out Time the TV series by the BBC next one I mentioned this because I didn't mention it at the time that it happened and I'm obviously really chuffed um, for the guy that this actually did occur because it's good to see a UK brand get this type of recognition but I'm sure most of you are aware that Cortez the brand from the UK did a collaboration with Supreme about a week ago it sold out in record time it was only a t-shirt and a hoodie but it absolutely sold out like so 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 fast um, and I think it was proof that Cortez definitely is the hottest brand especially streetwear wise on the uk streets right by now i don't think there's any kind of you know contest when it comes to that even if you don't like what they do there's definitely no denying that the brand is definitely up there in terms of what they're doing the only thing for me that i was surprised by really when i thought about it was that it's the first uk brand i can think of that's collaborated with supreme and they did so before palace which to me personally, you know, no, never being, no, no, well, now not being a fan of Palace and hating the people behind it and shit, it's good to see them not getting the collaboration with Supreme before Cortez. But taking my hate for Palace to one side, it was surprising to see Cortez get their collab before Palace. I'm not, I'm not, and again, I'm not too sure if this is a reflection on the relationship of the Supreme people behind the scenes, the head office people and the palace people founders. Maybe there's some sort of st static there or maybe it has to do with, you know, um, non-compete clauses because, you know, palace has turned into a collaboration incubator, basically, right? They just are collaborating with just about anybody. So maybe if you do a certain amount of collaborations, there's maybe non-compete clauses in your contract. So maybe they can't do a collab anytime soon and they have to be spec out for another time. But I was surprised that a Supreme would go after a brand like Cortez do a collab with that's fairly young right I, I don't know how old Cortez is I'm gonna say they're five years I'm gonna say maybe they're a bit more older than that but I, I, I don't think they're over a 10-year brand and obviously to do it before a brand like Palace is a big um, I feel like um, stamp of approval that Cortez are obviously doing great things here in the UK and clearly have their finger on the pulse um, it features a t-shirt and a hoodie as you can see here on the screen the t-shirt and the hoodie feature the same logo you got the Alcatraz logo rules the world underneath their little slogan and of course Supreme written on there I'm not gonna lie I kind of like that they went with Supreme rules the world um, as opposed to Supreme Cortez underneath I think that was a good um good decision in terms of branding wise because i think the rules of the world um you know phrase is something that you obviously we all know is representative of cortez the only thing i'm saying about i've said it before i've never really been the biggest fan of their logos i don't like that c star thing and i don't like the alcatraz logo the alcatraz logo i've never understood for like a uk brand to have like a logo of an Al the alcatraz prison it's just it's never made sense to me um but I'm sure there's a r rationale behind it. And I just I just don't like how it looks personally. Uh, maybe get rid of the ring or something. It's just something I don't like about it. And I also don't like the C. But for some reason, I feel like it works really well together with the supreme text at the top, you know? Maybe it kind of reminds me of some... Um, maybe, it's, maybe it reminds me of... Um, of some record label i forgot what it is record label sort of logo but there's something that works graphically really well about it so i'm happy about that and then on the back of the t-shirt I, I guess it's a poem or some sort of manifesto written there as well on the back of the t-shirt and um, the collaboration wasn't you know as plentiful as most people were expecting i just thought they would have maybe done a full collab with jackets and shirts and shit but i'm assuming this probably is the start of a long-term relationship i think so because um the founder of cortese clint he's been featured in a few of their lookbooks as well supreme so i'm assuming this is probably the first you know little um dipping the dipping their toes in the water and little by little we'll probably see a lot more of them going forward maybe this will be their kind of go-to uk brand when it comes to collab season and season out so i expect to see probably more but the sellout times again is proof that you know Cortez have definitely got their finger on the pulse because look at the mint is the second year of when they were sold out. Um, you got the you got the UK Times and the US Times, um, basically within the twenty second time frame 
oddly enough some of the times in the u.s are uh, you know they, they sold out quicker in the u.s on some sizes than in the they did actually in the uk so clearly it's proof that it's not just a uk europe thing they've definitely been able to rule the world as their fucking phrase says so it's great to fucking see that but obviously the backlash around it was hilarious certain people like stay grounded and a few other people digging out some of clint old um tweets about supreme which i think don't paint him in a bad light if anything they show that he was in the field he was you know deep in the game in the trenches which is interesting because i've never really i don't think i've ever seen this guy in real life or met him anywhere but I, i'm also a bit older than him and i purposely took a step back from being around the scene and shit and kind of just retreated back home and became a bit of a hermit for a few years so maybe i missed out on a whole generation and crew of people out there but i never really saw him out and about but it's good to see from these tweets that he was definitely in the streets um you know in the field um laying it fucking hang so in 2014 um he said fuck supreme man yeah we've all said that over the years i think we've all had i think that's a that's the power of supreme and why it's so resonated with us over the years um always have a love relationship with supreme over the years but it's still for me you know the number one number one streetwear brand of all time probably um in my opinion personally um it says here another tweet here from 2017 supreme need to pay homage to tyler the creator of an of already would supreme be as hyped without odd future this is an interesting conversation because i think Maybe because I was wearing Supreme way before, you know, Odd Future and stuff, guys came around. So it was never really a thing for me of Odd Future introduced me to Supreme. But it does need to be said that there is a generation of kids out there that only found out about Supreme and loads of other kind of, you know, um, streetwear brands because of Odd Future. Like, if not for Odd Future, a lot of these kids wouldn't have known what Supreme was. So maybe there is a lot of, maybe there is a need to acknowledge the role that they played in the trajectory of Supreme being what it is now. But, you know, I still feel like without Odd Future, Supreme will still be the number one streetwear brand in the world because they were, you know, a global power force before those guys came around. But it's no denying that these guys wearing the box logos, the t-shirts, the pants, the hats all the time was definitely 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 um played a part in their success especially with the younger demographic of kids out coming up another tweet from him in 2019 says all that line shit ruined supreme in the end because the worst wrong type of consumer started lining up which is funny because now you know the the whole point of you know one of the biggest marketing strategies of Cortez is the fact that he has the kids in his hands and they all kind of follow him around everywhere and there's cues and stampedes everywhere they fucking drop clothes so you know he's kind of seen the power of cues and how that can kind of add to the allure of your brand another tweet here from him in 2016 says i'd hate to be my third he's going to supreme lineups and pushing in front of children um <laughs> which is funny because i've definitely done that um but th that's why i've been that's why i was really happy when supreme did launch their online store especially in Europe, because it allowed people like myself who don't want to queue, who don't want to take part in that nonsense to just try to luck at home. Like I'm more than happy to just try my luck um, without bots at home and, and buy the things I want to online than having to struggle with the kids out there who have all the time in the world, all the energy in the world to queue outside. And sometimes the connection, because you know I've been out of the game for a long time. I don't know any of the security guards. I don't know any of the sales assistants. I don't know any of the man. I don't know anybody. And the last thing I want to do now at my stage of my fucking quote unquote life or career is trying to cozy up to a sales assistant to be able to get news on what's dropping when, or to try and suck up to a manager. Like it's, it, it was never me anyway, and I'm not going to do it now. So I'm happy that there's an option for for us people who don't want to do that sort of stuff to just buy stuff online because there is nothing more embarrassing than some guy in his fur he's trying to jump in front of a queue of kids and trying to fight kids for a fucking North Face Supreme Noopsie or something I mean that is not the way you want to go about life another tweet from him says my dog who designed the K9T works for Supreme now I'm happy and sad at the same time and then another tweet at the end here says brief interactions with the creators of Palace and the creator director of Supreme within a week 2016 um Actually, I met Noah once, actually, when I was out in New York. He was really nice. He was really nice, but the guy from Palace wasn't so. That's one of the, again, it, that, that's why it's really important. <laughs> it, as minor as these interactions are to be almost, that's why it's probably really important to actually try to be as nice as you can to people even if you don't, even if you're not in the mood, because you have no idea or sometimes how a very brief interaction could have lasting effects on somebody like myself, right? Because I'm a, I'm a bit of an emotional, sensitive guy. But I remember the time when I was wearing Palace, I, was, I, I legitimately might have been with some of the, 
within the first few people that fucking bought some of the t-shirts that they were selling in skate shops right this is when they first started they weren't even they didn't even have their own store um at that time right they obviously had online shit but they were selling only in skate shops so you had to actually go to a fucking skate shop to buy some of their shit and i was one of the first people to buy their stuff and i remember just trying to have a conversation with this guy or just trying to say i don't know trying to fan out or something and i was met with a wall of like big time and resistance and just rudeness i remember thinking wow bro like just another reminder of just how fucked up the scene is right and how bad vibes everything is that you know i'm sure i'm trying to show love trying to show appreciation but i get kind of big timed and i remember from that day onward i never wore another piece of their clothing ever again and i never will do you know what i mean i'm actively rooting for their failure like for that one interaction again it could and i could be reading a lot into it it could be absolutely nothing but that one brief interaction completely sullied the brand for me so uh, you know w when i see cortese having a collab before them it makes me smile um and oh, oh and the noah guy was really nice actually i, I met him what in new york um a few years ago when i was working for some company and um, he was really nice all the guys actually know her um, when i went to the noah store in new york were incredibly 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 nice very well very level-headed and chill and shit um the team there was really cool and then another tweet here from him in 2017 supreme mike jackson this is the only supreme piece i'll ever own so hey nothing too bad nothing too bad here um good to see that he got the collab i'm eager to see what else they're going to be putting forward um going forward i think we're going to see more stuff um in the up and coming seasons and hopefully um maybe even next year don't be surprised if you see an actual fucking retail store um you know so cortez are doing big things they're obviously selling out they've obviously got a big reach big fan base don't be surprised if you see more and more um growth from them in the next few years and maybe a retail store in a not too distant future i think that's definitely on the horizon for them so big up cortez supreme collabo is absolutely sick and yeah i'm eager to see what else they have going forward in the next up and coming few years <laughs> anyways my friends that is it that is episode number seven what three three of the excellent zinger show episode number seven three three thank you for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company if you've enjoyed the show please make sure that you like the fucking stream down below um obviously in the description you'll find all the links to myself social media wise in there and of course of course um if you have any questions and shit you know how to reach me via all the links in the description but for now if you listen to the audio podcast you will hear my tune today playing out right now and i'll see you guys on the other side peace